Thank you, and good morning. Uh, welcome to the ferry panel, better known as Sandy News Flash. Island people need ferries. Our ferries saved us again, and it's time to support water transit. Uh, you know, local records here in New York indicate that ferries go back as far as the uh, mid-1600s when the city was New Amsterdam. And the story has it that if you wanted to use a ferry in Brooklyn, you walked down near the water over what is now Fulton Ferry Landing, and there was a horn hanging on a tree, and you pulled the horn, blew it, and a farmer nearby came down, put you in a rowboat, and rode you across the river. So I guess that was the beginning of ferries here in New York. During the 16 and 1700s, most of the ferry services in and around the harbor, they were powered by oars, which is amazing. Obviously some uh, sturdy people in those days. And of course, there were horse-driven ferries and sail vessels. In the early 1800s, we had the invention of the steam engine, which forever changed the face of waterborne transportation and ushered in the era of steam-powered ferries. By the mid-1800s, Brooklyn and the New Jersey waterfronts had become bedroom communities for New York City. And with them, the first commuters of the day boarded ferries and plied the waters of the East and Hudson Rivers back and forth to work each day. The first such communities were developed by entrepreneurs who were also operating ferry service. So the real estate, real estate developers actually sort of set the stage for ferries, not unlike uh, what we're seeing here today. A couple of these panelists have carried the, uh, the model forward. Uh, I guess by the mid-1800s, this is really when ferry services were reaching its peak in and around New York. An estimated 7 million people a year traveled across the Hudson River between New Jersey and New York City. And another 33 million people a year traveled across the East River between Brooklyn and New York City. This was certainly mass transit in the truest sense. As the turn of the 20th century came and went, bridges, subways across the East River found their way into the New York City transit system. And by 1925, the last commercial ferry service on the East River was suspended. Hudson River service survived through the 1960s, but with the construction of the Trans-Hudson Tunnels and Bridges, most of the ferry services ceased operations by the 1950s. In the mid-1960s, the Verrazano Bridge opened, connecting Brooklyn to Staten Island, and the ferry service that used to be known as the 69th Street service was suspended. Finally, in 1967, the one remaining ferry service between New Jersey and Manhattan suspended operations, thereby leaving the municipally owned and operated Staten Island Ferry as the sole ferry in the harbor. Fast forward to today, there's been a huge resurgence in ferry service in and around New York Harbor with the most significant passenger volumes after the Staten Island Ferry on the Trans-Hudson routes using pretty much the same model as was used 200 years ago, real estate developers providing ferry service. In addition, with projected increases in population, uh, pop population and tourism, and a mature transit system with very few options to increase capacity, ferry service offers a realistic, practical, and cost-effective solution for increasing transit options. During the past several years, we have seen a renewed interest in the waterfront, which you heard a lot about this morning, now sometimes referred to as the sixth borough. We've also seen the une uneasy relationship between the nature of the waterfront and living, working, and recreating in close proximity. We've also seen how quickly transit options can be created along the waterfront, uh, both in terms of transportation planning and in the aftermath of natural and unnatural disasters. All of this points to untapped opportunities for increased ferry service in and around New York Harbor for passengers, and I'd like to throw this in, freight alike. Although a number of pilot projects conducted on intracity routes have yielded mixed results, 
I think we're all pleased with what we're seeing on the East River Ferry Service. And I think this would be, as they call it, a good off-ramp for me. We have a great panel assembled to discuss water one transit. And it is my pleasure now to introduce the panel moderator, Courtney Worrell, COO of Metropolitan Waterfront Alliance. Thank you. All right. So the format of this is that each panelist will give about a five-minute uh, presentation. And then we, Ina has been passing out note cards. If you have questions for the panelists, Ina will take your questions and give them to me, and then we'll, we'll start a conversation. All right, so go ahead, Helena. Hello, my name's Helena Durst. I'm president of New York Water Taxi and uh, a family member of the Durst organization and the Durst family. A little bit since uh, Jim did this wonderful lead-in with developers investing in, in waterfront or the ferries, we, we are about uh, 10 million square foot uh, Midtown landlord. We're also um, helping with the Port Authority and, and the building of One World Trade Center and a 10% owner of the building. So a little bit about freight, which I wasn't planning on talking about. It would be extremely helpful from a developer point of view if we could engage freight onto the to the island, just in the way of being, being able to bring materials as well as um, people who are working on on uh, on projects. So. Thinking about Sunset Park, it's a huge area for, for people who are, end up being uh, contractors and working on construction areas. And to be able to be able to bring people from Sunset Park directly to downtown Lower Manhattan with all of the projects that are going on, including the World Trade Center, as well as um, uh, South Street Seaport and Howard Hughes' uh, development, as well as the various other projects that are happening around uh, Manhattan, it would be a huge benefit not only from a uh, people transportation wise, but also a, a material moving as well as large cranes. Cr bringing cranes onto the island is a huge issue. So thank you, Jim. I wasn't planning on talking about that, but excellent lead, lead in. New York Water Taxi provides transportation for over a million passengers per year. We provide a large range of services, including the IKEA ferry, all day access pass between 44th Street and the Hudson down to Fulton Ferry, and that's the yellow water taxi that you're going to see passing by here probably about hourly to every 45 minutes. We do things also to take an interest in what New York City residents are doing. How can we be bringing New York City residents out into the waterfront? We run an Audubon Eco Cruise Tour, which I think is a great highlight of that, which allows New Yorkers to see the wildlife in the harbor, including seals, dolphins, and other birds and marine wildlife. Um, we also work with South Street Seaport to help book the Pioneer and market the Pioneer. So, enough about how fantastic a dreamy sunset sail is on the Pioneer, which I all encourage you to go to. What I want you to know about my business is I'm trying to get people in the seats. I'm trying to get butts in the seat. Because the more butts in the seat, the higher, the more able I'm able to cover my costs. Um, in the ferry industry, the margins are low and the expenses are high. If I have a full or empty boat, there's no cost difference to me in the amount of staff, fuel, maintenance, marketing, and general administrative benefits for payroll taxes, as well as taxes and rent expense for docking my boats. Everything's the same if the boat's empty or if the boat's full. If somebody's paying for the boat or if the boat's going out empty, doesn't matter. There's still like those expenses. The boats, and I would thought I would be used to dealing with large expenses, I, aka having that monkey on the ba my back, but for being a landlord, of course, because we have real estate taxes, payroll, similar, but it's actually double on the boats. Triple as, as it relates to maintenance, because being in sea salt water is much more a harsh an environment than it is to be on land and air. So we will provide almost any service we can. We go to Randall's Island to provide service for the Quidditch tournament, even. So on to the topic at hand, why we're all here. My HR director tells a very sad story about having to evacuate on September 11th, evacuating from downtown Manhattan, jumping from the bulkhead onto, watching somebody jump from the bulkhead onto a tug and breaking his leg. And this is why my family invested in New York City waterfront ferries, because we wanted to provide access to be able to evacuate in emergency situations. If we don't have the infrastructure to be able to evacuate the island via ferries, there's gonna be nothing there. If we're not doing it on an everyday basis, 
When it gets to be really bad, how are we going to rely on those fairies to be there if we haven't been practicing with our fairy services? And practice is not the right word. People also need to be used to boarding fairies, know where they're at. It has to be an everyday thing. That's why fairies are so important when it comes to an emergency situation. And that is the exact reason why the founders of New York Water Taxi, Douglas Durst and Tom Fox, knew that New York City needed better, to be better prepared for evacuations and invested in the, in the uh, capital investment to provide a ferry transportation. Despite our original mission, New York Water Taxi no longer aggressively bids for long-term subsidized routes. When we ran the East River Ferry Service for minimal subsidy, frequency of service and passenger, passenger ridership was low. Sometimes winning a bid from the city is actually losing a bid. Through my greatest frustration with the city funding is how it takes full fare paying passengers away from non-subsidies, subsidized boat tours. No offense, Jim, we've talked about this. <coughs> Even the mayor himself has publicly reminisced about going on cheap dates on the Staten Island Ferry. It pains me to talk about the city's fascination with this the city's fascination with the Staten Island Ferry to see a free Statue of Liberty tour. It just pains me to hear it. I hope you can encourage that same behavior. The city, the, city and, the city and ferry operators are losing out on valuable revenue by not taking advantage of flexible ticketing pricing. Right now, the annual ridership numbers for the East River Ferry are 38% commuter, 62% recreational, and on the, on the weekends, 98% rec recreational ridership. If we can determine the, the increased price for when somebody wants to go to, say, Governor's Island from a various stop on the weekend and have that at $5 versus the $3 for the commuters, I think that would make a lot of sense. The public, the public and policymakers need to understand how providing zero or standard minimal fares is damaging the New York City ferry industries. It creates a public perspective where ferry tickets don't need to be paid for. The public doesn't think we need to pay for ferry tickets because we have Staten Island Ferry running for free. When in reality, we all know here, everybody here knows that running ferries, boats, even if it's a powered boat, even if it's a kayak, it's expensive to keep. It's expensive to maintain and it's expensive to buy the equipment. One reason that ferries can't take advantage of flexible ticketing is because telecommunication infrastructure in the, horrible, in the harbor is dismal. Every day, my team and I work out issues to get over the, con to trying to just get constant 3G connection on any of our peers. I have T-Mobile at Battery Park in Manhattan, I have Verizon at South Street Seaport, and I have AT&T up at 44th Street in the Hudson, because I can't get a constant signal anywhere in the harbor from one provider. I have to use multiple providers. It is very frustrating for me to hear how I'm losing ticket sales because I can't get a 3G connection. I'm not even asking for power or a, a wire connection here. I just want 3G connection, be able to use my cell phone. There's a serious lack of upland capital investment. Many upland areas of ferry docks do not provide basic amenities, such as cover for passengers, power, or even strong or consistent 3G connection. One reason that upland connections and amenities are spotty in New York City is that no single agency has authority over all docks or and passenger ferries. Being stuck between two city agencies is like a child being born into an unhappy marriage. Unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> to, pro to provide a five borough ferry system, we need consistent funding, we need a public that better appreciates ferry economics, and we need a single government authority that un understands the uniqueness of the New York City ferry industry. I want to thank Metropolitan Waterfront Alliance for having me speak at our Leadership for our City of Water, of City of Water 2013 conference. Failures are our greatest teachers. My closing story is about a familiarization boat tour that we ran out of for the Harlem Tourism Board up at 125th Street in the Hudson River. As we went to lower the bow loading passenger ramp to our boat, the ramp could not lower all the way because of a default in construction. The mostly female tour in their, in their Sunday best and their largest hats were being hosted over a gap with my, by my deckhands. Everybody got on the boat fair and safe but I'm glad to say that I'm a part of this industry because every day is a new day and extremely exciting. Thank you. Well, thank you, Helena. That is a tough act to follow. So I, 
I just, uh, I liked uh, Jim's opening remarks because it harkened back to the good old days of uh, ferry operations in New York Harbor, and it was just, I think, in this area here, where a lot of it started, Robert Fulton and the Livingstons, and then, and then Vanderbilt came along, and, uh, you know, the way they used to compete for uh, ferry passengers would be to actually uh, have fistfights out in the harbor to see who could get to the dock first, so... I think it's it's probably quite uh, symbolic that I'm here in the middle between these guys, uh, and uh, and there's this uh, Panama Canal in between. So uh, <laughs> some things don't change in New York. Um, I also was very happy to hear about uh, uh, to to hear the uh, Jim and Helena talk about freight because uh, usually that's what I talk about. That's my first. Uh, I guess that's how I started at uh, the Economic Development Corporation and. Um, I think we're very excited that um, one of the one of the things that got announced today is this this unique partnership uh, with Billy Bay, uh, with MWA, with Saker Aviation uh, to uh, uh, to promote uh, uh, seven landing locations, seven berth locations uh, in and around New York Harbor. Uh, you see, there's a nice piece in the Wall Street Journal about it today. And one of the one of the elements of that is uh, freight transportation. And as Helena was saying, the movement of uh, of overweight uh, and uh, large objects in and out of Manhattan uh, Island, which uh, you know, for many of you know, uh, there are not a lot of ways to get uh, you know heavy equipment, construction equipment into the harbor or into Manhattan through the harbor. And uh, we hope that in this partnership, that will be one um, new aspect of maritime transportation that uh, that can be promoted uh, with uh, under uh, the leadership of Billy Bay. So. Um, you know, this is a, a very uh, unique opportunity to be here with so many people who know so much about uh, ferries. We really are, I, I feel like, uh, uh, on the shoulders of giants because we have uh, not only this amazing panel, uh, you know, with Jim's leadership, Helena, Paul, but in the audience uh, we also have, of course, Tom Fox, uh, who really uh, was one of the pioneers in ferry service, and, uh, and Janet Cox, uh, who's our partner over at the Port Authority, who, uh, you know, she runs the Hudson River and we run the East River, I guess. That's how it's sort of working out. So let's talk about the East River, because that's been a, you know, a wonderful experience for EDC. Again, our partnership uh, with uh, New York Waterway and Billy Bay to, uh, uh, to introduce ferry service uh, on the East River, and uh, that service, as you know, began in June of uh, 2011, and uh, we, uh, you know, we did it. A bunch of staff people at EDC. Uh, I need to shout out to David Hopkins, uh, who we imported from uh, the West Coast, from Seattle, which is a ferry town, uh, and Adam Zarenko. Uh, they were kind of the uh, partners in uh, restarting that East River service, along with our good friend uh, Venetia Lannan and uh, and Madeline Wills. So. Uh, and what they did was they, they really took a lot of um, uh, expert advice that we did a citywide ferry study and we really looked at what would be the elements of, uh, of ferry service to kind of replicate the success uh, on the Hudson River. And some of those, I guess, uh, those um, uh, parameters included having uh, regular service with uh, reliable headways, you know, 20 to 25 minutes that you could really count on with direct service to both uh, the Midtown and the Lower Manhattan uh, business districts. Um, and, and to do it in a way that would also capture all of the emerging neighborhoods that were growing up on the Queens and Brooklyn uh, waterfronts. And to pilot a study that would look at how we could integrate the commuter service with some recreation, particularly on weekends, uh, that would meet ridership demand, meaning that you'd always have a ferry uh, to pick up passengers and you could use sweeper boats to make sure no one's left on the docks, uh, to effectively market uh, the ferry uh, and uh, to get the word out that this was a new transportation resource that people could count on, uh, to look at the ticketing infrastructure to make it uh, as easy as possible to get a ticket, um, to really care about customer satisfaction, to make riding the ferry an enjoyable experience. And the results really speak for themselves. We have ridership that is almost one and a half times the, uh, today what we expected for the three years of the pilot project. So um, we thought we would be um, uh, in the vicinity of 400,000 riders per year. We're getting over uh, nearly a million a year riding the East River Ferry. And, uh, you know, we did a, a ridership satisfaction survey last summer, and this is what we found. It's kind of interesting statistics. 
But one, uh, no surprise, 86% of all riders are New York City residents, and most of them live in Brooklyn. Uh, on the, on the onboard respondents, 69% self-identified as commuters, uh, including the weekday peak, weekday off peak, and weekend. 60% of onboard uh, commuters uh, report riding the ferry four or more times a week, so it's a regular part of their lifestyle, which is, uh, which is great. Um, over 80% of the riders walk to the ferry, which is, uh, which, which, which is great because it shows that we're promoting you know, a, a cleaner way of getting to work. And we're very excited you know, when bike share starts uh, uh, later this year that that will uh, increase kind of the catchment area for ferries uh, for the East River Ferry. Um, one other thing that I, I, I get a kick out is 99% of respondents are either very satisfied or satisfied with uh, the East River Ferry service. So it's a little bit like the old Soviet elections, I guess. You know, <laughs> everyone's happy, they know who to vote for. So. Uh, so, uh, so at the same time we're working, is it, oh, it may have something to do with the operator, I guess. Nice clean boats and good coffee, right? Uh, so we're looking at, uh, you know, recommendations that these riders have given to us, and some of those include increasing the hours of operation. I think that's one thing we, we want to see because people go to all these cool new neighborhoods on the Brooklyn waterfront, but they don't know how to get home, so we have to, we have to look at that. Uh, they also uh, would like to see an improved uh, fare structure and, uh, and improved weather protection at the landing. So we'll be working on all that, and that's the purpose of the pilot. But, you know, one, one thing that really came out uh, to us again, and it really speaks to Helena's point, is the resiliency of ferries, the ability after Sandy in two days, you know, thanks to all the work that really everyone in the room has done, to get the ferries back and running, even when the L train was running, two days later you had, you know, lines of people uh, going to uh, the ferry uh, landings in, on the Brooklyn waterfront. So, uh, building on that, what EDC has done is we've applied for, uh, and really this is a, a Jim D. Simone idea, is the idea of building flexible ferry landings or purchasing ferry landings that can be deployed around the city in times of emergency. And we've seen them, you know, we're getting these emergencies every few years now. So we're very hopeful that, uh, you know, you may have heard this through uh, Senator Schumer's announcement about the NERD boat uh, and the support for that application. Well, you know, uh, yes, the NERDs are important, but uh, it's also uh, about, um, you know, increasing the resiliency of New York City and, uh, and putting, being able to deploy landings like we did in Rockaway like we did in Midland Beach, uh, so that people who are really uh, having a tough time getting to work, will, uh, it'll make it easier, and using the waterways as that transportation resource. I was hoping to have uh, a PowerPoint presentation today to uh, help, uh, to help uh, to tell the story I'm going to tell, but there, aren't the, there isn't the equipment for that, but I really don't need it, because all you have to do to follow the story that I'm going to tell today is turn around when you get a chance, and uh, those of you on this side of the room can see it, the Erie Lackawanna Ferry Terminal in the middle of Hoboken, because that's really the, the central part of the story that I'm going to tell today, which is really about uh, our efforts uh, post-Sandy. Um, so Billy Bay Ferry Company is really more commonly known under its, uh, under its brand New York Waterway. Uh, there are two companies that do business under that uh, brand. Um, there was discussion earlier of some of the, the giants of the uh, industry, the ferry industry, and the reinauguration of ferry service in New York Harbor. Uh, but, the, but the largest name in, the, in that effort really was Arthur Imperator Sr., who, uh, yes, was interested because of his real estate interest, but really reinaugurated ferry service in New York Harbor in 1986. We operate um, in partnership with. Arthur's company, Port Imperial Ferry Corp, and my partner in crime is here today, Armand Cohen, who operates uh, their business, and we very much operate it as a, as a partnership. We are separate companies. There are 35 vessels in the combined fleet. Um, we have uh, been, as I said, in operation since 1986, and over that period of time, uh, carried over 250 million passengers. Last year alone, uh, over 8 million passengers. Uh, so, um, we, we have a number of public partners in, that, uh, in our efforts. The Port Authority uh, is the uh, 
uh, owner of the Gary Lackawanna ferry terminal, at least the ferry portion of the of the terminal. Um, the uh, that's one location of four major terminals that we operate in partnership with our uh, public partners, Pier 79, uh, in partnership with the City of New York, uh, in Weehawken, ferry terminal there in partnership with New Jersey Transit, and both the Erie Lackawanna Ferry Terminal and uh, World Financial Center Ferry Terminal in partnership with the Port Authority. Now, those terminals and uh, a number of others comprise the over 18 uh, routes that we operate on a, on a daily basis that comprise that, those 8 million passengers. We also operate in partnership with the City of New York with EDC, the East River Ferry Service, uh, which I'll talk a little bit uh, more about in a second. So on uh, on Tuesday, uh, the Monday of the, uh, the Tuesday after the Monday of the storm, uh, we all woke up to a stark uh, reality, and in the uh, Holland Tunnel was flooded, the Lincoln Tunnel was flooded, all of the trans uh, uh, tunnels underneath the East River uh, were flooded. The path tubes between New Jersey and Manhattan were flooded. And the Amtrak tunnel that uh, New Jersey Transit shares with Amtrak to get their Midtown Direct trains into Penn Central was flooded. And uh, ferry service was really the primary alternative for uh, 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 most commuters coming into New Jersey in those early in those early weeks. Um, and as Andrew mentioned, by by Wednesday, that very Wednesday, uh, we were in operation uh, on over half of our routes. By the following Monday, we were in operation on all of our routes. Our infrastructure um, saw very little in the way of uh, significant damage. We were able to be operational in fairly short order not without the assistance of uh, a number of uh, public agencies. One, one the thing that we also woke up to on that Tuesday morning and every morning thereafter for a couple of months was a, uh, a morning meeting then conference calls with the Army Corps of Engineers, the U.S. Navy, the Port Authority, New Jersey Transit, FEMA. Every morning uh, began with a conference call with, uh, with, those, with those groups. Uh, the routes that we operate from the Erie Lackawanna terminal are, uh, in their origin, were uh, uh, load shedders for uh, Port Authority Trans Hudson service. So from the Erie Lackawanna terminal, where 30,000 commuters come in by train every day, they have an alternative, and, and train service ends at that location, um, they have an alternative of either the path train to Midtown or the path train to downtown, and for a period of months, uh, uh, neither of those alternatives are available. So only the only alternative was, in fact, uh, ferry service. And um, uh, we, with our existing 35 uh, boat capacity, and uh, with the help of Helena and New York Water Tax during that first month, we chartered uh, a couple of vessels a day from them to help with the load. Um, over that period of time, our normal traffic is, is about 30,000 people a day, and we were uh, more than double that, that for a period of months. And if you, if you follow the exact patterns, we go from the Erie Lackawanna Ferry Terminal, we go to World Financial Center, and we go to Pier 11. And there is a, a, a direct uh, path train from Hoboken to uh, World Financial Center. Uh, that service was out for about three months and if you look at the traffic patterns over that three month period of time we were about triple our normal uh, volume. Uh, New Jersey Transit which operates the train service into uh, the uh, Hoboken Terminal uh, didn't have uh, as many trains as they could operate even when the Amtrak tunnel was reopened because of the power problems in the tunnel they couldn't send as many trains through. So they engaged us to provide a supplemental service, which we, which we did in a matter of days, operating uh, ferry service from uh, Hoboken to Midtown. With a, we ended up carrying on that brand new route, uh, 2,000 people a day for approximately uh, two months. And that was possible um, because of the coordinated effort of the federal and state and, and the Port Authority of getting that terminal reopened by the by the Monday after the storm. 
we operate ferry service from Jersey City to World Financial Center. Um, and that service was, uh, was out for a period of months as well. We tripled our normal 3,000 passenger uh, a day volume, uh, really on our existing uh, inventory of, of vessels. One of the things unique about the volume there was that the, the area around Pier 11 downtown um, was clearly among the more devastated areas in Manhattan. All the office buildings on, along Water Street and Front Street were out of service and uh, we didn't have to operate as many boats to Pier 11 during that period of time as we normally do. Um, but a lot of those same companies, their, their redundancy plans dating back to post 9-11 uh, thinking was they had second offices in Jersey City. So all of a sudden we were not only carrying inbound commuters, but we were taking all these Manhattan residents out to Jersey City during that same period of time. So that, that's the details of what we experienced, but there's obviously a larger message here, and it, it, it's a message that uh, New York Waterway has demonstrated time and time again. Uh, post 9-11, it was the primary way out of Manhattan and uh, on that day. Uh, and for, for a period of time thereafter, while the path, while the, uh, path trains downtown were out. Um, after the blackout, the same thing. And every once in a while, when a, when a plane lands in the Hudson River, we, we help out there too. Uh, so that's my story of uh, our post-Sandy efforts, and we'll have to entertain questions later. All right, thanks, Paul. Thanks so much for your uh, introduction earlier on, and, and thank you also for uh, for inviting me to uh, participate uh, in this uh, in this event. It's good to be here. Um, a couple of words uh, of introduction about the Disaster Research Center, just to, to set in context a few of the remarks that I'm going to make um, earlier on. The, uh, the Disaster Research Center was the first center in the world devoted to the management aspects of disasters. It was founded in, in 1963. Um, at the time, of course, uh, the Cold War was one of the principal uh, concerns uh, amongst disaster managers in the U.S. But over time, the uh, the mission of the uh, of, of DRC has uh, has shifted to include interest in every kind of disaster: natural disaster, technical disaster, human-caused disasters, um, and looking across all the phases of disaster: things that we can do in advance of disaster to make it less likely, the actual response phase, and then to think about what we can do to recover afterwards, hopefully to recover to a better state than we were prior to, to the disaster so that the disaster is less likely to happen. One of, the, uh, one of the disaster research methods that DRC has pioneered is quick response disaster research where the object is to get a research team into the field at the site of the disaster as quickly as possible in order to be able to see in as much real time as, as we can what is actually happening, what decisions are being made, what challenges are arising, how problems are being solved, and what are some of the principal response organizations that, uh, that are involved in handling that event. We found that in terms of the validity of our studies that that helps us be much more effective than just relying on after action reports or other kinds of documents that are produced uh, retrospectively, even though we do, of course, of some sort, still it's good to have some early people on the ground in order to have some initial data on which to, to base our later conclusions. Over the past few years, a number of the studies that we've conducted have been of the, uh, well, the Japan earthquake um, a couple of years ago, the Haiti earthquake, the Sichuan earthquake in 2008 in China, um, Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Ike, and of course 9-11. Uh, where um, colleagues in, uh, from DRC and I were, were able to come to the city within two days. We were, of course, in, in Newark, Delaware. That's a two-hour train ride. And we were able to come to the city within a couple of days after, after that. We arrived on Thursday, on September 13th. And we spent most of the next couple of months in the city um, observing all the disaster response and relief operations that took place around Ground Zero and various uh, supply and staging areas at warehouses at the Improvised Emergency Operations Center, which then was on at Pier 92 um, here on the Hudson River. And then we visited the city many times over the, uh, over the, the last, well, over the, well, the last 10 years or so. One of the events that we heard about that when we were undertaking this initial study or this initial trip into New York was the boat evacuation on 9-11. And 
uh, of course, the story's been, been told in, in several ways. And actually, when I was invited to speak here, I was sort of acutely conscious of the fact that probably I'd be talking about the boat evacuation to people who were in it in one way or another, who were closely exposed to those events, and where, in fact, a lot of what we know at DRC about the boat evacuation was actually told to us by people who might be in this very room. So that's sort of an, kind of an awkward feeling, like, what can I, what can I tell experts that are new? We, we undertook a fairly long-term study of uh, the boat evacuation. We interviewed 100 uh, boat operators and waterfront workers, which maybe is like 10% of the number of people who participated in that. If you look at the roster of the people who were awarded the 9-11 medal by the Department of Transportation, which was specially struck um, for that event. And from our standpoint, even though in the research world we're, we're generally reluctant to declare that something was successful, we don't like to issue judgments of that sort, but rather let the data speak for itself, but at least in this situation we've been comfortable over these last many years talking about that as a successful event. Successful in the sense, in the sense that with a couple of exceptions, one of which was, was cited here this morning. Uh, there were comparatively few injuries, there were no vessel accidents of any substance, even though everything was taking place very rapidly without any planning in advance, mostly improvised and mostly improvised um, in very short order so that a lot of people were evacuated over the course of about eight hours. So apart from understanding that event in terms of, in terms of what's to be learned about that specifically, we were all also interested in learning about what could be taken away toward other emergency situations. Um, and so there are a few things that are, that are worth, uh, I think, talking about briefly. Um, for those of you who are there, this is new, uh, not news to you. For those of you who are not, uh, it, might be, it might be somewhat interesting. One of which, of course, that made that entire effort possible was the very strong networks that exist within the waterfront community. We talked to people who told us that everybody knew everybody who knows somebody else. And just judging by some of the acquaintances that I've seen uh, taking shape here in, in this room, I think that's probably so. Now that's standard emergency management uh, philosophy, that uh, you are much better off knowing in advance who you are handling an emergency with than you are just meeting them uh, on the spot. Within the emergency realm, we have a, a standard emergency management protocol called the Incident Command System which is meant to take the place of the fact that people may not know each other because a lot of people who arrive at a disaster scene might be strangers to each other. Nevertheless, we find that even with the incident command system, which is a nationally mandated structure, it works better when people have known each other in advance and have worked together and have trained together. One of the interesting things is that um, Although on a daily basis, there's a, a strong sense of competition here in New York Harbor because of course the, the freight market, this is a tough market, no doubt about it. But it is helpful on the day of a disaster to know what your competitors' capabilities are just as it is important at any other time. There's a lot of mobility amongst the people who work amongst the different boat companies here in the harbor, so they all knew each other and they knew each other's boats and they knew where the boats could be taken and so forth. So, uh, competitors one day, maybe frenemies the next, but that certainly uh, stood, stood everybody in the harbor in good stead on 9-11. So James, about, about 30 and, more seconds. What, I'm done already? Oh. I've, I've barely gotten started. <laughs> All right, anyway, uh, two other things. Um, a lot of rules were broken that day. Boats overloaded, boats carrying passengers that weren't certified for that. Um, normally, you don't want to encourage people to break a lot of rules on their daily basis. However, that does give you a bit of flexibility when it comes time for a disaster. What made that possible was an element of trust amongst the people who worked on the boats and the people who ran their offices ashore, that, uh, that the people who were doing those flexible things had a little bit of top cover so that they could be, uh, they could be confident that as long as they were making basically sensible judgments, um, that they would be okay. And of course, the very strong local knowledge of the people who operate in the harbor. Without those things, I think probably the operation would not have been as successful. And so for other comments, I'm pleased to take questions afterwards. Thanks. Oh, thank you very much. That mainly a population imperative underscores the need for waterborne transit, not only in emergencies, but to connect to a broader set of options in normal times. There's been a tremendous movement of people towards coastal counties, and New York City is the biggest, has four of the biggest, densest 
counties in the country. Uh, uh, the areas are vulnerable in extreme uh, events, weather events, and these areas do not have good access to p get people out and supplies and emergency help uh, in during disasters. And it's made people a lot more vulnerable and people in poverty tend to experience this um, uh, the most. Uh, I have a brief handout uh, probably covering some of the statistics I won't really get to. Um, so uh, uh, at any rate, the uh, coastal counties account for 29% of the U.S. Uh, population. As I mentioned, uh, the four New York City boroughs are the densest coastline counties, even though Staten Island uh, doesn't rank that high, its population in between 1960 and 08 more than doubled its density. Um, the uh, vulnerable sectors, we've had lessons from Hurricane Katrina, black and, and, and poor populations disproportionately isolated and in flooded areas. Uh, in our study nationwide, we found uh, the elderly disproportionately concentrated in areas where hurricanes are most frequent. And during Hurricane Sandy, here uh, nursing home populations and people in public housing were among the, those that were uh, not really evacuated effectively. Second point, connectivity, which a number of the other people, a point people have made, uh, ferries don't operate in isolation. They're part of a vast network of land-based infrastructure, and that is often what fails in extreme events. And we have to think of that total um, picture. Uh, they're interconnected very heavily with electric power and computerized control to a greater and greater extent and that is often what fails. In the 2003 blackout, uh, we had the problem of the electrically driven docks not connecting uh, with the ferries. The uh, great thing about ferry service is that it has the ability to scale up and down. There is a network of providers when there aren't enough boats, they call other people. Actually, the electrical utilities and Verizon were able to do the same thing, rolling in um, generators and cell towers. Um, we did a big study in connection with Columbia of uh, how people left the World Trade Center area. And it turned out that uh, we did include ferries as a mode of travel. Uh, in the uh, immediate minutes, uh, as people were trying to leave, only 2% uh, reported relying on ferries. 97% by uh, you know walking, which is understandable. But to their secondary destination, 16%, almost 17% relied on ferries. They play a big role there. Um, and again, the caveats that I mentioned, we have to harden the land-based in infrastructure and connect it better uh, to our ferry systems. During Hurricane Katrina, the ferries may have experienced gas shortage problems, uh, relying on diesel, uh, keeping up the uh, supply of boats um, uh, as well. And finally, I gave out a handout on the statistics um, between uh, which uh, from the Bureau of Transportation uh, statistics uh, between 1990 and 09 operating expenses increased by hundred twenty percent for ferries um, yet uh, the oper the um, uh, the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the revenues increased, but the operating revenues, um, the operating revenues increased by only 35%, but expenses increased by about 120%. So there was a huge uh, dichotomy uh, at a much faster rate. Um, and so expenses are really increasing 2.3 times uh, the rate of 
of revenues. Uh, and uh, so this is something that has to be uh, contended with. Um, trip length has been increasing, um, and the industry, na again, all these nationwide figures, seems to be consolidating number of systems going down while the number of vessels uh, are going up. So there is this bigger picture uh, that our ferry systems fit into, and many of the problems uh, that uh, uh, that uh, we experience here are part of a nationwide effort that needs to be uh, addressed. Thank you. Great, thank you. All right, so um, if you haven't yet written a question on an index card, please do that now and Ian will collect them. But the first question for the panelists is, uh, what would each of you say to uh, the next mayor about what should be done about improving ferry service in order to make ferry service also a part of our emergency response system? I would say to the uh, next mayor who will have to potentially make uh, some important decisions about uh, ferry service, the continuation of the East River Ferry Service, uh, the expansion of the East River Ferry Service, uh, to consider the impact of, of subsidies on ridership. That has been a large part of the uh, success of the East River Ferry Pilot Program. And um, the, the, the fare structure is one that's uh, accessible to uh, a, a wide group of, uh, of uh, New York City residents, and um, it's only as a result of the, the subsidy that we're able to offer that fare and the degree of uh, frequency that the service, it, it just wouldn't happen on its own. And I think that's the major policy consideration that has to be addressed as people think about the expansion of service going forward. I guess this is relevant to me and Jim the most, but uh, don't fire us, right? <laughs> but, uh, but, but seriously, I think um, I'm interested in Jim's point of view, but I think uh, certainly let's Let's think of the ferry service as a part of a network, a transportation network, and let's build on the strengths of the existing uh, systems, both in the Hudson and the East River, and how can we make links to new ferry landings to expand service in a, in a smart, conscientious way? Um, I certainly agree that ferries should be looked at uh, as part of the uh, city's transit system. Uh, when the question was asked and Paul started speaking, I started thinking about one of the biggest problems we have as an industry is at the federal level, you know, there's a lot of money out there for highways, there's a lot of money out there, maybe not enough, uh, for other forms of transit. But if you start getting into the federal bureaucracy, of the uh, FTA and the Federal Transit Administration and the Federal Highway Administration, which is where the bulk of transportation funding comes at the federal level. The only place you even see ferries mentioned is the ferry boat discretionary fund. Now, for example, the Staten Island Ferry gets a certain amount of federal funding. Never in any of the documents will you find ferry. We have to shoehorn into fixed rail and you sit with people from the federal government and say I'm not a railroad I'm a ferry can't you at least put this in your documents so that is a big hurdle for the industry at large before ferries are, are genuinely accepted as public transit they have to be recognized at least at the federal level I mean we've been trying very hard to do that in any case that's one of the hurdles I see um, one of the things I would underscore, uh, uh, again, is, is to look at this larger system, strengthen the land-based infrastructure to support waterborne uh, transportation and connect it to the other modes of, of travel. It will benefit waterborne transportation to have those other modes uh, strengthened. And I, I can't uh, emphasize this more. We're becoming more and more and more a coastal nation, a coastal city. The population is still moving there. After some of the worst uh, earth, uh, hur hurricanes we had, the population of the coastal counties continued to increase. 
I mean, so that's a lesson we need to uh, be able to deal with that. Now, that said, um, ferries are also, and waterborne transportation in general, subject to damage by uh, uh, extreme weather as well, and we'll have to think about ways to fortify them. And, and think. Um, and thinking about the system, thinking about the different operators, if you take one of us out, if you take a New York waterway, a statute cruises, or if you take New York water taxi out by going outside to bid for East River Ferry Service or another service, you're really hurting New York City ferries because you're then taking 10 boats, possibly if you, if one of the, one of our companies goes down as we do rely on each other, but if one of our companies goes down, you're then taking 10 boats, if it were New York Water Taxi, out of the operations of services in an emergency. So just thinking about the industry of New York City, the ferries there, and how unique we are, and how we rely on each other, and how it is would be near impossible to go outside of the New York City metro area to find another ferry operator, just as it relates to demobilization and mobilization from a home port. So let's, um, let's expand a little bit on the infrastructure issue. What is it in terms of infrastructure that we would need on the waterfront to better, to better have ferries play a role during emergencies? Anything, I know Helena mentioned wireless, connect, you know, that's an issue, so go ahead, anyone. And not so dependent on, uh, you know, a, a fixed electric power connections. Maybe they'll need their own uh, solar uh, cells and uh, 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 other forms of renewable energy so they're not so vulnerable during a power outage. Uh, I'd really like to work on that issue of the 3G uh, connectivity with Helena, but also I think the uh, uh, the flexible landings is something that we we feel very strongly about is what we need because when after Sandy we had to go find you know landings the one in the Rockaway is in New Jersey was originally in New Jersey but we shouldn't have to go look for them we should just have them in the inventory. Um, well, I'd like to recognize what we've already done because there um, I mentioned the four terminals that we in the private sector manage on behalf of our public se sector partners that represents over 350 million dollars of investment in upland infrastructure um, and it, they're they're very nice facilities and they are underutilized so the upland part is to me not the most pressing problem along the East River there's no question that uh, uh, there's, a, there's a need for the sort of amenities where waiting areas where simply where people are simply protected uh, from the environment. Secondly, um, in terms of connectivity, I forgot to mention earlier that one of the things that happened to us as a result of the storm is that all of our land-based, most of our land-based ticketing equipment was flooded and it was no longer operational. Some of the routes we have ticket agents on, on the boats, but on most we do not. And a year earlier, fortuitously, we had developed, we were the first transit agency in the country to develop a mobile ticketing application where um, passengers could not just look up schedule information and, and, and that sort of thing, but they could establish an account, buy a ticket, then activate that ticket and their phone became their uh, boarding pass and it didn't have to be scanned we had all the different uh, security measures built into the uh, the image and it was it had animation and the like so we had a number of security measures built in and as part of, of a continuation of that effort on the very issue of connectivity we are in a, a building with um, homeland security support a mesh network a series of uh, uh, a couple of dozen antennas that's going to create a, a proprietary pipeline for every one of our terminals and every one of our vessels and it's in construction it's going to be deployed later this year so that there will be immediate connectivity at every one of the landing sites that uh, that we operate at least for purposes of activating this this ticketing network that, that we've built but so there's a lot of there's a lot of public investment already there's, there's a need for more but I do want to recognize what's already been done. So I want to ask James Kendra, the, so the evacuation after 9-11 you deemed a success but 
Are there other, was there another type of disaster you, you guys have thought of where maybe our region isn't prepared to use its ferry system? It, 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 were there vul vulnerabilities? Well, I think uh, one of the principal vulnerabilities that was, that was talked about, it's already been mentioned, is that at the time there was a comparative lack of waterfront infrastructure that made it possible in order to tie boats up. So, as you know, people were tying their boats up to trees or lampposts or whatever, broken fences or whatever was available in the North Cove area. The, uh, the ornamental fence structures actually prohibited people from getting to the boats that were lined up there, so those were cut down uh, all up and down the waterfront. So, in many ways, the, the, the waterfront had been designed for the amenity value of people on the shoreline rather than the functional value of boats that were, that were going to be working there. So, in, in that sense, you know, Manhattan, which you know, for many years, for, for centuries, had had such a large seafaring presence, had really turned its, its attention away from, from the idea of, of, a, of a, a working waterfront, which is a popular phrase here. Um, and that was probably one of the principal obstructions. Nevertheless, I mean, people very resourcefully uh, were able to, to make it work, but it was, it was not as expeditious as it might have been had there been a little bit more maritime infrastructure left down there. Okay, I have a question from the audience for Paul. After Sandy, after normal transport alternatives came back, did ferries keep any of the storm-related gains? So did you keep, how much of the ridership did you maintain? We maintained, some, we maintained our existing ridership and then some in some locations, particularly in the Hoboken area. I mentioned that uh, the area around Pier 11 is still not uh, back to, uh, when I say the area, I mean the office buildings located in that area are not fully occupied. My guess is only about two-thirds of the capacity has, has returned. So our routes that go into Pier 11 still have not recovered to their pre-storm uh, levels. But in a number of other areas, we have picked up uh, passengers who stayed with us. Okay, sure. Oh, and if I could just just make one quick note to follow up on that on that earlier point. There, architecturally or historically, there there needs to be no conflict at all between you know between shoreline functions and and waterfront activities. I mean, New York Harbor and Manhattan and New York City in general. This is a maritime place, so there's there's no aesthetic. Or there doesn't have to be any aesthetic conflict between having functioning infrastructure for tying boats up or, or whether planned or, or emergent um, and other uh, you know upland functions those are entirely compatible all right so another question from the audience which was also one that I had so please discuss emergency response capabilities of um, the of the city in light of the large number of people who are on the water and the number of trips per day and I think what this is getting at is that if we had a, a more extensive service how much better of a role the ferry system could play. So does anybody want to talk about expanding the, sur expanding ferry, the ferry system and um, what that might do for benefiting the city in many different ways? You know, I, <clears throat> I'm a little ambivalent about tying the ferries so much to emergency response. It almost reminds me of how the U.S. Merchant Marine has hitched its uh, it's caught to the Defense Department, and that's not been all that successful. I think that it, the ferry system provides a tremendous way in which the city and the local metropolitan area can expand transit. And if it expands transit for the sake of transit, the uh, facilities will be available, you know, in the case of a disaster. So I'm not, I, I am a little ambivalent about making plans, uh, building infrastructure, and certainly people like Helena is not gonna invest in uh, you know, excess uh, vessels just to sit around and do nothing in case an emergency arises. If we can promote this as a very viable way to uh, augment and grow transit in an area where our transit infrastructure is mature, you, know, you look at the, um, you know, the subway projects on both the east and west side, these are huge undertakings that take forever. Whereas ferries, you know, we're just a very lucky city and area where we have this type of water arrangement. And if we can build on that, then I think the rest of it will naturally fall into place. Okay, so, we had some questions about specific locations that we uh, that people believe we need ferry service to. So, 
Uh, people want to know about ro service to Roosevelt Island, to Fresh Hills Park on Staten Island, uh, to East Harlem, and uh, to the World's Fair. Like Castamini's talked about the World's Fair. <laughs> Thanks. So that's a great question, and oh, this microphone really works. Good, okay. So uh, one of the things that I didn't get to in my remarks was that uh, based on the success of East River Ferry, uh, EDC is going to be launching a update to our 2010 uh, citywide ferry uh, study. And uh, the, the goal there is to take in all the lessons learned under the East River pilot and, uh, and then apply those lessons to different parts of the city, I, I think all of which were uh, mentioned on that list. And we're going to be doing a similar um, exercise that we did in 2010, which is to, you know, is to look for the networks that make sense to see maybe what we're talking about now is more since we have a strong system on the East River, can we build hub and spokes to these more outlying uh, areas. And uh, Roosevelt Island is certainly one that uh, because of the Cornell uh, Technion campus uh, is, we'll be looking at, but also uh, Astoria, you know, the Queens Waterfront, South Brooklyn, uh, other parts of uh, uh, the Rockaways, of course, um, building on what we've done after Sandy, uh, as well as the Bronx. We want this to be a, a true, uh, you know, five borough uh, ferry system when we're done, but, uh, but we want to do it the right way. And I think really doing it the right way is ensuring that there's operating subsidies, as, as both Jim and I, I believe Andrew has pointed out, that without confident um, subsidies, very hard to run a service because, again, if we don't have people in the boats who are at least paying a fare box plus some type of operating subsidy, it's impossible to run a frequent and consistent service. Um, being able to provide service out to East Harlem is actually a very good question. As, as Jim well knows, some of the bridges get very low there, so we'd probably have to build a new type of boat to be thinking about a front-loading boat that would be able to provide ferry service and so thinking about the capital cost again what is what is that encounter and how do we actually do it I think is the question okay and then there's another question is it realistic that ferry service could ever be integrated with an MTA Metro card monthly option and yet Great question, because uh, we've been working with the MTA on what that system would look like and how what the cost would be to uh, to integrate. We're probably looking at something that's closer to what's already uh, exists with PATH or with the air train, you know, something that's a regular metro card, but um, it, it's definitely uh, doable. We, uh, you know, hope uh, to do it soon, in fact. But uh, now we have to look beyond the metro card because I think the MTA is going to come out with something else uh, in a few years. So. Yeah, I think that would also make sense if uh, people got the transfer rights and stuff to actually to the MTA systems. Well, that's the key question. Yes. Because um, integration from a technical point of view is pretty easy. Um, it's a question of where the fare goes. So if you're asking a privately owned operator to accept a free transfer from uh, someone who used their ticket first from the MTA, it doesn't quite work. So the, the real challenge of uh, the MetroCard integration is dealing with the fare box itself. Okay, um, uh, one last question from the audience before our final question for all the panelists. Ferries are needed by people with mobility disabilities too, even in emergencies. How can boarding and disembarking be faster and safer for wheelchair users, people with uh, crutches, walkers, and other invisible disabilities? Uh, the city's infrastructure is currently accessible. We spent a, uh, quite a bit of money a couple of years ago complying with Local Law 68, which mandates accessibility for all of the private ferry landing, all of the ferry landings for that matter. So that is something that's already built into the law. That's right. If, uh, and the same on uh, the private ferry landings where uh, each landing has to be ADA compliant in, uh, for uh, it to be served by commuter service. And so we, uh, you know, one of the questions we get asked is why don't I have ferries, so I have a landing here, why don't I have regular commuter service? In some cases it's because we don't have ADA compliant uh, uh, peer facilities. So those step barges, those flex barges will all be ADA compliant. <coughs> 
All right, so the, the last question I'll ask, and then we'll have each of you say um, something for the closing remarks. Um, so this is from our staff. So Im imagine a harbor filled with, sh with ferries shuttling thousands many times per hour around the harbor, uh, and a full ferry service much larger than what we have now. How would that change New York City? And what would that mean for people and for the city itself if that was the type of system that we had? Please, Ed, lots of you, please answer that question. There's no one answer, obviously. <laughs> uh, I think it would be a city that would be much, much more accessible. I've often thought, just like New York Water Taxi, they, they, they actually have doubled the number of boats they really have, because every time you look out there, you see one of those yellow things going by, and it looks like they have at least a hundred of them, you know? But it should be the type of thing, you just walk down to the water, and almost like a bus, look up and down the river, and you see one coming, and it would just, it would make for a much, much more accessible city, and it would uh, basically really engage the waterfront. Exactly. It would be able to engage the waterfront. New York City for, has, has had to turn its back on the waterfront because of our industrial history in the waterfront. But finally, we, we were able to regain what is one of the best natural resources we have in New York City, which is our, is our waterfront. If you turn around, you can see that New Jersey has unfortunately put residential properties on the waterfront. We have not. And we can actually be able to gain, gain a lot from being able to use our fantastic natural resources, not just to be it for recreation, but also for transportation. And the more that we have people here, the more bodies that are here, the more things there will be to do because now a cafe will want to open on the waterfront, then a playground, then, then something else. We really need the, the waterborne transportation to be bringing people back down to our waterfronts. I couldn't agree more. I, th I think about Venice, I think about the Vaporettos, and uh, just all the activity that we could see in the Hudson River, but also uh, uh, up on the Upper East River, uh, and, uh, and um, you know, everywhere in between. I think it would make it a better city, a city on water. I think we're in the middle of, of watching it happen around us. Um, it's, uh, the Hudson River uh, service is, is a, a mature uh, service at this point, but the, the East River service is, is new, and it's not going to take too long, within the next five years, let's say, when the East River Ferry Service will, instead of its current configuration, begin at Cornell, uh, Roosevelt Island, and uh, end in South Brooklyn at Governors Island or in Red Hook. The developments that are take place in Governors Island are going are gonna to drive the need for that expansion of service. So I think it's an exciting time for the ferry industry. I think we demonstrated the, the uh, role that we can play, and I, and I think uh, we're seeing it happen around us. Well, I'll just say generally that before I went to, into academia, I used to be a merchant seaman. So to me, any boats on the water are a good thing. <laughs> And uh, studying uh, traffic and transportation, I think it could, uh, if scaled up enough, could really, really uh, uh, address our tremendous road tra uh, congestion. Uh, and even the subways are experiencing congestion beyond belief, so it could share in, in one of those. New York City still ranks extremely high in road-based traffic, and if we could stop the cars uh, north of the city and get them on boats, it might be, uh, it might be one way to uh, prevent that. Thank you to our audience for some great questions. And thank you also um, to, uh, to Ina and Harrison who helped so much with putting this together.